Hi there everyone. In this video I'm going to take you through everything you need to know to tune your BL Heli 32 ESC to get the maximum performance out of the motors on your quadcopter. Now I know that there are lots of different ESC firmwares available and that not all of you are going to be flying BL Heli 32. I would ask that anyone who's familiar with other ESC firmwares, if you could leave a suggestion in the comments as to how to translate what I'm talking about in this video to other firmwares, I'd really appreciate it. Now, without any further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so to start with, I'm going to take you through the process of connecting to your BL Heli 32 ESC. So the first thing you're going to want to do is go to this web address. I'll put a link down in the video description. And this is where you can download BL Heli Suite 32. Now, don't be confused by this BL Heli Suite. That's for BL Heli S ESCs. And we're talking about BL Heli 32 ESCs in this video. So pick one of these three, Mac, Linux, or Windows, and go ahead and download it. The download button's up here. Once you've downloaded it, go to the folder where you've downloaded the file and extract the zip folder. Then go into that folder and you should see this list of files. You want the exe file. So just double click on that and run it and you'll, it'll bring up this window. Now this is the point where you're going to want to connect your quad to your computer. So plug the flight controller into the computer by USB and then plug in a battery. It's best to make sure your props are off for this. Once you've got the battery plugged in, go back to this window, BL Heli Suite 32, and look down at the bottom. You'll see a port and a board rate. Leave the board rate at default. Go to the port and select the COM port that is your flight controller and click Connect. Then, once that's worked, click Read Setup. You should see four ESCs detected if you've got a, uh, a quadcopter. So if that's all working and you click OK, you should see all of these options. And we're going to be going through some of the most important of these options that you might want to tune for your particular build in the rest of this video. You'll want to check that you're on the latest version of BL Heli 32, and you can see that revision number here, 32.8. If you're on 32.7 or an earlier version, you might want to update your ESC. And the way you do that is by going to this button, Flash BL Heli, selecting the latest revision for your ESC, and then clicking OK. Once you have the settings set the way you want them, click this Write Setup button to write the settings to your ESCs. And you should see an information window here. I've got nothing to update here because I haven't changed any settings, but it should update for you. Now, before I jump into how to tune your BL Heli 32 ESC, I wanted to take a moment to give you some background on how BLDC motors work, because I think this information makes the settings in BL Heli 32 make a lot more sense. So this schematic shows a 12N 14P brushless DC outrunner motor. And this is the typical type of motor that's used in the majority of mini quads. The 12N refers to the 12 windings in the stator, and the 14P refers to the 14 magnets or poles that are in the rotor. And the phases, there are three phases, are labeled A, B, and C. You can see A, B, and C here. The magnetic north poles in the diagram are shown in a red color, and the magnetic south poles are shown in a green color. So this is how the phases are usually connected. You can see that there are two common configurations, a star configuration or a Y configuration, where the phases are all connected into the center and the center is a neutral point. That is not typically used in mini quad motors because it tends to produce a low KV. 
uh, and a kV of a motor that is lower than we would like for our application. Mini quad motors are usually connected in a delta configuration because this provides a higher kV and allows you to get more RPM out of the motor. You can see that we have three motor wires, one, two, and three, and the phases A, B, and C are connected across the wires. So between one and two, we have phase A connected. Between one and three, we have phase C connected. And between wire two and three, we have phase B connected. So you can see that the ESC can drive current through any of these phases, depending on whether it connects the wires one, two, and three, either to positive voltage to the battery or to ground. And that is how commutation works. The ESC connects those different motor wires to positive voltage or ground and drives current through the phases A, B, and C. Now inside the motor, the windings are wound either clockwise or counterclockwise. Now here, the capital A windings are wound clockwise and the small A windings are wound counterclockwise. And what that means is that when phase A is energized by the ESC, when current is driven through that phase, the capital A solenoids, the capital A windings, become magnetic south poles. But the little a solenoids, which are wound in the other direction, become magnetic north poles. And you can see that that allows the motor to um, push and pull on both the magnetic north and magnetic south poles. Now this diagram here shows how the ESC commutates the motor. Now commutation is the process of energizing the phases with electric current in a certain order and at a certain time to cause the motor to rotate. So I have this animation which shows how the commutation process works. And if I can stop it at just the right time. Okay, so here you can see that we have the capital A winding is a magnetic south pole. And that means that it's been energized with positive current. So we're just here at about 90 degrees in the commutation cycle. And you can see that it's a magnetic south pole, which means that it's pushing away this magnetic south pole and it's pulling on this magnetic north pole and encouraging the motor to rotate in a clockwise direction. Now, just a moment later, the situation has changed because the motor outrunner has rotated a little bit. So you can see that now we have a magnetic north pole being pushed away by this capital A winding and the magnetic south pole being pulled towards the capital A winding. And you can see that the capital A winding has now changed from a magnetic south pole, which is what it was, to a magnetic north pole. And so that must mean that we now have negative current or reverse current flowing through the capital A winding. And by switching between positive and reverse current, this allows the winding to commutate the motor and make it rotate. If we look here, when the capital A winding is directly opposite a south or in fact a north pole, that's what we call the zero crossing of the phase. And at this point, the capital A winding is not energized at all. So there's no current flowing. So you can see the different stages of commutation. There's a stage where no current is flowing. Then there's a stage where we have positive current then back to a stage where no current is flowing and then a stage where negative current is flowing and all the while the motor is rotating. And we go through a full 360 degrees of commutation every one seventh of a mechanical revolution. So there are seven full commutation cycles per rotation of the uh, outer rotor of the motor. And the reason for that is that one full commutation cycle is one pair of poles, a south pole and a north pole, passing the phase. And because we have seven sets of north and south poles, that means seven electrical revolutions for one physical revolution of the rotor.
So as you watch this animation, you can see that the three phases, A, B, and C, are working together to encourage the rotor to rotate in the clockwise direction. And phase B and phase C are doing exactly the same thing as phase A that we've just discussed. They have positive current, they have no current when the zero crossing happens, and then they have reverse current. The difference between phase B and phase C is they're just 120 degrees out of phase with phase A. And so all that means is they're doing the same thing at a different time in the commutation cycle. Now you might ask the question, why are there three phases, not two or four or 50? And the answer is that it's a balance between performance and cost and complexity. So you can make motors with fewer phases, but they don't have the same performance. They're more difficult to start and um, they have more torque ripple. So it's a, a noisier motor. There's more vibration and that sort of thing. So that's not as desirable for what we want to do. And you can also make motors with more phases than three phases. There are motors with four or five or even 12 phases for different applications. But the reason why we don't have more phases in our application is simply because every additional phase you add is more windings, it's more complexity in manufacturing, it's more FETs on the ESC, it makes everything more complicated. And so it turns out that three phases is a really nice balance between cost and complexity and performance and kind of gives you the best of both worlds. There's one final thing to say about this period here for a sensorless brushless DC motor because the ESC is actually measuring the voltage on the phase during this period here and it's using that measured voltage to determine when the zero crossing actually happens. And that determination of the zero crossing is how the ESC knows how fast the rotor is rotating and when it should energize all the different phases. So if there's a lot of electrical noise, that can sometimes make it difficult for the ESC to detect this zero crossing because there's lots of noise and it's hard for it to measure the voltage accurately. And that is what can cause things like desyncs. So that zero crossing is really important for making sure that the ESC stays in sync with the motor as it's spinning round and round. So now that we've got the theory out of the way, let's jump into how to tune your ESC. And we're gonna start with motor direction. And I think this is the most important setting to know how to change. Some motors might be spinning the wrong way when you first build your quad. And this motor direction setting is really the only way, apart from physically resoldering the motor wires, to correctly change the direction of motor rotation. Now, there are a few different options here. You have normal and reversed, which are the ones that you're probably most likely gonna be using. You also have bi-directional normal and reversed. Now, bi-directional mode is only used for 3D flying. That's where you actually reverse the direction of the motor in flight for hovering upside down. Unless you're into 3D flying, you're gonna to want to only use normal and reversed. Now to select which ESC or which motor you want to change the direction of, you come down here to this multiple ESC tab and you're going to want to right click on the ESC you want to change the direction of to single select it, then change the motor direction if it's not correct. Then you're going to want to write the setup to that ESC and then you're going to want to test that the motor has actually changed direction. And you're going to want to do that for all of the motors that are rotating in the wrong direction. Now, just to be clear, this is the only way to change the direction of your motor in software. Don't try and do it in the um, beta flight flight controller configurator. You can tell it the motors have changed direction there, but that won't actually change the motor direction. You really should be doing it here in the ESC settings. So the next setting I want to talk about is motor timing. 
And to understand motor timing, we need to go back to the commutation graph that we discussed earlier in the video. So here's the commutation graph again. You can see that theoretically, the ideal situation would be to energize the phase B here at zero degrees. So that's like the theoretical moment that we would want to energize the phase. But this motor timing setting allows us to tell the ESC to energize the phase a few degrees, and these are electrical degrees, not mechanical degrees, a few electrical degrees before that theoretical moment, up to 30 or 31 degrees, I think, before the theoretical moment when it would be energized. So why would we want to energize a phase early? Well, the answer is that each motor phase acts as an inductor because it's a coil of wire. And this means that it takes time after the phase is first powered on for the current to reach its maximum value. And so to compensate for this lag, we must power the phase on slightly before we need it. And that's what the motor timing setting allows us to do. It allows us to power the motor phase on a little bit before we actually want it to be on to give that current time to build up. You can see the effect of this lag here in the graph. We have this switch closed where we turn on the, the power to the phase, but the current in the inductor doesn't immediately jump up. It ramps up over time to its full value. And then when we open the switch and um, de-energize the phase, you can see that the current falls gradually back down to zero. So what is the recommended motor timing? Well, faster spinning motors, so the types that you might find on smaller quads, do benefit from increasing timing. Also, slower motors can benefit from reducing the timing because the time for the phase to energize of a big motor is, is less in comparison to the rate of commutation than for a very small fast spinning motor where actually it takes quite a long time for the coil to energize compared to how fast the motor is spinning. For most mini quads, a timing of 23 degrees, which is the medium high setting in BL Heli S, or 23 degrees in BL Heli 32, is a good starting value. Increasing motor timing can help reduce desyncs and can increase top end power, but can also cause your motors to get hotter. Decreasing the timing uh, makes things like desyncs a little more likely, but can make your motors slightly more efficient um, at the cost of some power. So I would say 23 degrees for a five inch. And if you're running very small quads, you might even consider increasing it even more from 23 degrees. And if you're running really big quads like seven inch or eight inch or 10 inch, you might consider reducing the motor timing um, down a little bit. And you're looking to find that balance where the motors stay nice and cool, but you still get plenty of torque and responsiveness and top end power as well. BL Heli 32 has an auto timing mode, um, which you can use. It's typically a bit on the conservative side, so you tend to sacrifice a little bit of power with auto mode, um, but that will compensate the timing based on uh, what the ESC is detecting as it's spinning the motor. So that can be uh, you know, a good thing for, um, for larger quads or very small quads. It kind of tries and does its best to get the timing right, but it tends to be a bit on the conservative side. So if you're not too worried about sacrificing a little bit of top end power, um, auto is probably a good solution for you. The next setting we're gonna look at is PWM frequency. And you can find that here. There are two settings, PWM frequency low and PWM frequency high. Now, when a phase is being driven, it's not just on at 100%. The power to the phase is being modulated using pulse width modulation or PWM. And here's a graph of what that looks like. It means that in this area here where the phase is energized, it's actually being pulsed. And depending on the duty cycle of the pulse, 
that controls the amount of power that the ESC is giving to the motor. And that's basically the throttle position. So at 50% throttle, you'll have a 50% on, 50% off pulsing during this period when the phase is energized. At 75%, it'll be on for 75% of the time and off for 25%. And at 25% throttle, it will be on for 25% of the time and off for 75% of the time. And that's happening only when the phase is energized. Now, a higher PWM frequency can give a smoother approximation of the average voltage that the um, motor phase is supposed to receive because the motor inductance is better able to smooth out the pulses of voltage. Now, it, you can see what's happening here in these two diagrams. At 24 kilohertz, at 50% duty cycle, we have these longer pulses and longer gaps. But at 48 kilohertz, the pulses are shorter and the gaps are shorter. But the proportion of time that the uh, power is on and off remains the same even as the frequency changes. Now, having quicker pulses leads to a little less torque ripple. So that's a smoother um, application of force as the rotor is spinning. But it does cause a little bit of additional heating in the ESC FETs because FETs heat up most when they actually are switching between on and off. So the more often you switch them, the hotter they get. Torque is also reduced by having these faster pulses because a shorter pulse allows less time for the current to build up in the in the inductor in the motor windings so the peak current and therefore the peak torque can be somewhat reduced by increasing pwm frequency so it's a bit of a trade-off a higher pwm frequency gives you a smoother running motor and maybe a slightly more efficient motor as well but it's a slightly less torquey motor a little bit less mechanical torque out of the motor you can see what's going on in this diagram with long pulses the uh, current is able to build up to a higher value before then falling again. Whereas with shorter pulses, the current doesn't build up quite as much. And so your average current is slightly lower. It's, it's only slight and that does slightly reduce your mechanical torque. So my recommendation is to use the variable PWM frequency that's in BL Heli 32, 32.8, the latest version. This variable PWM frequency allows you the best of both worlds. So you set a minimum PWM, which is 24 kilohertz, or perhaps even less, for maximum torque at low RPMs. And then you set your max PWM to 48 kilohertz, or perhaps even a bit more, to give you the smoothest possible top end. Now that low PWM frequency is the frequency at zero throttle and the max PWM frequency is the frequency at full throttle. And it's just a linear scale between the two. So as you increase the throttle, the PWM frequency increases from 24 to 48. The next setting I wanna talk about is ramp up power. Now this setting controls how quickly the PWM duty cycle is allowed to increase as the motor speeds up. Now, why is this important? Well, when a motor is spinning, it produces a back EMF voltage that opposes the battery voltage and opposes the current flow in the windings. And it's actually the electrical work done by the current from the battery against this back EMF. That's what's converted into mechanical power. Now, this back EMF is really, really important because the back EMF also acts to limit the current through the motor and stops it smoking itself. Because the current through the motor without the back EMF would be so high that it would just uh, cause the windings to melt. Now, as the motor speeds up, the faster the motor is spinning, the larger the back EMF. As the motor speeds up, the back EMF is increasing the whole time. So how does this affect ramp up power? Well, if you were to suddenly greatly increase the power that you're putting into the motor without first allowing the motor time to accelerate its speed and build up a bigger back EMF, 
you could drive truly enormous currents through the motor windings and that could actually cause damage to the motor or to the ESCs. So this ramp up power setting prevents that happening by saying, well, when I'm increasing power to the motor, I'm not going to do it all in one go. I'm going to do it a little bit gradually and I'm going to allow the motor to speed up because obviously when you increase the power, the RPMs are going to increase and it's going to speed up and build that back EMF. And that increased back EMF is going to prevent too much current flowing through the motor windings and causing the motor to smoke itself. So this ramp up power controls how quickly that power is being increased. Ideally, what you want is the ramp up power set high enough that you can access the full mechanical torque of the motor and get the motor accelerating as quickly as it possibly can. But beyond that, there is no benefit to further increasing the ramp up power because once you've got the full mechanical torque of the motor available, extra ramp up power is just um, driving more current through the windings. It's just saturating that magnetic system. You're not getting any benefit from the increased current and it's just causing extra heating which will give you hot motors and could cause your motors to smoke themselves. So the default value of 50% is okay for most five inch mini quads, um, but I typically find that the optimum ramp up power for five inch is more about more around 20 to 30%. So I usually set my ramp up power at 30%. If you're looking to tune ramp up power and find the optimum value for a given quad, what you can do is start with a very low value, I think the minimum is 3%, and increase the ramp up power in steps of 5 to 10%, and stop increasing the ramp up power when you no longer see an improvement in the quad's response in the air. Because what that means is that you've got enough ramp up power at that stage to access the full mechanical capacity of the motor, and adding more ramp up power above that isn't actually helping, it's just causing motor heating. And I've done this experiment and I found for me that I certainly couldn't see any difference above 30% for my five inch quads. And that's why I set my ramp up power to 30%. Now for larger quads, ramp up power can be typically reduced from default. So uh, for a seven inch quad or, or even a five inch quad, you could reduce it a bit to maybe around 15 to 20% for a seven inch and maybe 25 to 30% for a five inch. For smaller quads, however, there may actually be a benefit to increasing the ramp up power from default because a small motor will accelerate much more quickly, build that back EMF much more quickly. And so that means it can accept a faster increase in ramp up power. And this can be really important for small quads and tiny whoops to actually getting more responsiveness, more performance out of the motor by increasing that ramp up power. So if you're running a smaller quad, maybe three inch or smaller, consider doing an experiment where you gradually increase the ramp up power from the default and see if a ramp up power above 50% actually gives you a little bit more responsiveness from your motors. And obviously keep going until you no longer see a benefit and then stop and maybe go back a little bit. That may give you a bit of a performance benefit. So the next setting I want to talk about is temperature protection. And what this does is it reduces power to the motor if the ESC overheats. Now really the default should be fine for this 140 C, but if you're particularly worried about your ESC overheating for some reason, um, you could reduce it a little bit, maybe 120 or 100 degrees. Um, I would say typically the default will be fine. DMAG compensation is a setting that modifies some of the behavior of the ESC related to the handling of missed zero crossings. And for most quads, default or low should be fine. If you're having desyncs, you can try switching to high and seeing if things improve. But for um, most mini quads, that shouldn't be required. You might find for very large motors, very large quads, um, that there is a benefit to switching DMAG compensation to high. So sign modulation mode is quite an interesting feature. 
This feature varies the duty cycle of the PWM at low RPMs to more closely approximate a sinusoidal driving voltage. So you can see in this diagram how this works. You adjust the PWM duty cycle of the motor drive and that more closely approximates a sinusoidal voltage in the motor windings. For big motors that spin very slowly, this can make them a little bit more smooth with less torque ripple. However, it also does reduce the torque slightly. At higher RPMs, the ESC switches back to normal trapezoidal drive, um, just because that's most effective and efficient for high RPM drive. I would recommend leaving this feature off unless you're running props larger than seven inch diameter. And then you can maybe run an experiment to see if it provides a benefit for you. What I would say is torque at low RPM is critical for flight performance and we really don't want to give any up for mini quads. And so I would strongly advise for um, anything seven inch or smaller, leaving the setting off to maximize the torque at low RPMs. The break on stop feature makes your props stop instantly when you disarm the quad because rather than just allowing the prop to naturally freewheel to a stop, the ESC actually applies braking to slow the prop down as quickly as possible. I quite like this feature for the added safety benefit, particularly for large props which can take a while to spin down, just because if you are about to hit something um, and you disarm, you can be more confident that you're not going to hit that object with the prop still spinning. However, this setting may make it slightly more likely for the quad to get caught up in a tree if you have it on, because if the props can't rotate when the quad is disarmed, then that can make it more difficult for a quad to fall out of a tree. While we're on the topic of safety, I would also recommend that you set your quad up as I do so that whenever you arm the quad, the props are always spinning so that you know when the quad is armed that no one is going to go and approach it. There are some settings in Betaflight that allow you to have motors stopped while the quad is armed and I think that adds a little bit of risk. So there are a few settings here that you need to leave at default, but I'll go through and tell you what they all do. So low voltage protection turns off the ESC when the battery voltage falls below a certain level. Now for a plane, this is really useful because it just means that you can glide the plane into a landing and not cook your battery. But for a mini quad, the moment the ESC turns off, your quad is gonna fall out of the sky. So I would always leave low voltage protection off and that way you'll kill your battery, but you might just get your quad home and that's the most important thing. Current protection, this will limit the motor power if the current through the ESC is over a certain level. And initially this might seem like a good idea, but actually there are lots of situations where you get very short spikes of current through the motor, particularly when the motor is changing speed or if you clip something. And in that situation, it's actually, you don't want the current to be limited because you want the motor to, to be able to recover as quickly as possible. So I would typically leave current protection off and the current consumption of the motor is then really going to be controlled by ramp up power. So if you have that set correctly, you shouldn't need current protection on. Current sense calibration, um, I guess that's if you've got a digital current sensor and you're, you're calibrating it. My ESCs all have analog current sensing, so I don't really use this setting. Um, Non-damped mode, for mini quads, you want to leave this off. You don't want to switch it on because it will make the quad respond really horribly in the air. Basically, if you turn this on, it will turn off the active braking of the ESC and active braking is really important. So just leave this at default and off. Um, stall protection at normal, I've, I've never seen a reason to change that. Um, auto telemetry, you can leave that off because beta flight will turn on telemetry by itself when it connects with the ESC. Um, S-Bus channel and S-Port physical ID, um, if you've got this connected to a beta flight flight controller, just leave these at off because your flight controller 
is going to be dealing with the S bus and S port and all of that stuff. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you now feel like you have the information you need to get your ESC set up correctly to get the maximum performance out of the motors on your quadcopter. If you like the work that I do and would like to support me, I have a Patreon. As a patron, you will get access to a Discord server where you can discuss these topics with me and other like-minded pilots. Patrons also get sneak peeks of some of the things that I'm working on. At the moment, that's a seven inch long range frame, a new type of carbon fiber, and I'm just about to start a five inch racing frame design as well. So if you're interested in those things, please follow the link in the video description and sign up. That's all I have for you for today. So until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.